Firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to speak today about calf rearing and our dairy beef system here at Manor Farm. So often I've been to meetings or webinars where the case study used has been somebody who's pioneering and at the top of their game, who's had the opportunity to spend a lot of time and capital on building their enterprise. And I've come away feeling deflated and unrepresented because as a typical family farming business, I don't think I can afford much of the time and investment that's been talked about. So for me, the goals felt out of reach. So today I'm hoping to be able to share my story as a typical mixed family farming business, sharing my struggles and how step by step over time, we have overcome them and significantly improved both the health and productivity of our livestock through simple and achievable steps. We have made some small investment, but the payback and return on that investment has been more than worthwhile. So a simple background, we're a mixed dairy beef and arable farm. We milk 350, housed all year round and an all year round calving pattern. Predominantly using black and white semen, none of it's sexed as previously been said, and we'll switch generally to a beef breed after around about three attempts if we're not getting the cow in calf or with any cows that are problematic and we don't really want to breed with. Everything is reared and finished on farm with all of our males being castrated and taken through as steers. It's a very simple system, as anybody who knows us will know that we are very simple people. So if we look back at our system um, pre-2018, all of our calves were reared in individual pens right the way through to weaning. We were tube feeding colostrum for the first 24 hours, but if I'm honest, the colostrum management wasn't great. Nothing was tested and quality checked. So in all honesty, we hadn't really got a clue what the calves were getting. But like so many farms, we'd been getting away with it. So if it ain't broken, why fix it? It was then around about 2018 or 2019 that we started noticing that pneumonia was becoming more of a challenge. And that was not only in the milk calves, but also in the older weaned calves as well. And this problem quickly escalated with scouring, finding rotavirus and coccidiosis present as well. It eventually got to the point where, embarrassed to say, we were losing maybe up to 25, 30% of our calves at one point. And those that we weren't losing that carried on for the next 12 to 18 months, we were seeing continued problems with bouts of diarrhea and also breathing problems and losing some animals right the way through as well. We were spending a fortune on drugs and we were unable to control it. We we're even losing calves as early as two or three days, having them autopsied and finding that their lungs were absolutely shot, riddled with pneumonia. By chance, it was around this time that our vets were hosting a meeting with Zootis talking about pneumonia and their vaccination that I went along to and was very forthright with my thoughts, explaining clearly that it was useless on our farm. We were getting no decent results from it. And all credit to Zootis, within a week they were on farm taking samples and looking into this matter for us and soon discovered that we had mycoplasma bovis. So to cut a long story short, we got together with our vets and Zootis and we put together a plan where every animal was treated and this was written into our herd health plan. So it's not ideal, but we found that it did the perfect job and almost immediately was getting the results. Our calves were doing so much better and not only with the pneumonia, but we're also noticing far less scouring as the coccidiosis and the rotavirus were clearly secondary infections. We had invested in a robotic feeding system, um, which had spent probably 12 to 18 months sitting in the box. Because of the problems that we had, we were too frightened to get it out and use it. Um, but now we felt we we're at the point where we were willing to give this a try and set it up. We had a purpose-built unit for it, which was 36 metres long and 18 metres deep, and it was split into five sections. We had 110 square metres at one end, which was designed to have nursing pens in where the calves would be reared for the first week and then they'd be transferred into one of four pens, each capable of holding 25 calves and was around about 140 square metres each with one feed station. And the theory was with our calving pattern that we'd be able to rear 25 calves in, well, they'd be produced in two to three weeks and then we'd start on filling pen two, then pen three. And by the time we're filling pen four, pen one would be then weaned. So we'd have opportunity to get that cleaned out and have it leaving empty just for a few weeks whilst it was sterilized. We were warned having calves in batches of 25 might cause us problems, but we'd made the investment, we'd got everything ready and we were willing to give it a try. 
and we monitored it closely. Our teats on our feed stations were changed twice a day. They were sterilized in between, and we felt that the calves had ample space, airflow around them. It was a good airy building, and there were, you know, we were more than happy to give it a go. I think it works out each and every calf has five and a half square meters of space, which is around about three times the minimum recommended allowance. The calves seem to be doing really well. We didn't notice any bullying and they seem to be thriving. It was around at this point, next slide, where Selena turned up on farm to look over the calves. Now, don't get me wrong, I know Selena is a rep and she has a product to sell, but I always like to have people come on farm, especially people who understand plenty about their topic and have another set of eyes to look over what we're doing. So easy it is to become blind to your mistakes that you're seeing every day and they become oblivious to you. So using Selena, we looked over and I mean, we hadn't even noticed that we really that we'd got a bit of milk scours after the hell that we'd been through for the last couple of years. The calves looked great as far as we were concerned, and that wasn't a worry. But with Selena, we looked to tighten things up. The first thing that we did was focus on our colostrum management, which we decided that every piece of colostrum was going to be tested. We'd be freezing any of high quality and only feeding what is good. So we were making the best use of what colostrum we had and all the carbs were getting the full benefit from it. We then switched to the transition milk formula for the next seven to five days while the carbs were in their individual nursing pens. And then the carbs would be transferred onto the machine in groups of up to 25 where they were all fed the premium quality heifer start powder. The final thing we did was to move, as you can see in the photo, the nursing pens into the actual feed pen that they would stay in for the whole period. And the theory is that we're not going to be taking calves. They're all reared in the same area into different pens. So if we do have any problems, any bugs arise, it's just hopefully going to stay in that one individual pen and not spread between them all. So our protocol, which remains to date, is to ensure that all calves have two to three litres of good tested quality colostrum as soon as it's realistically possible after birth. And then this will be repeated after six to 12 hours, followed by another two feeds at 12 hour intervals after that. They then have five to seven days being fed transformula by a teat bucket, two and a half litres twice a day, and also have fresh water available at this point as well. They then have nine weeks on the machine where we also start to introduce solids, which I'll come back to in a minute. Now, the last thing I want to do is give Bonanza any excuse to put their prices up. But I've got to say, incidents of scours since we've moved onto this system uh, are, are an absolute rarity. Few and far between. The, the only case I can think of to mind was only a few weeks ago where we had a couple of calves scouring. And that was during our busy period where I was stuck on the baler. We were flat out in harvest. And one of the things that got neglected was the calf machine wasn't um, calibrated for an extra couple of weeks. And when I got back to do it, I realized that it was just dispensing too much powder. So we were overfeeding the calves. As soon as I recalibrated it, that soon cured everything. So this is the feed plan that we're using. Uh, and this is what we've been on now for quite some significant time, probably three years. So from day zero to day two, we're feeding the colostrum, which is all tested. Day three to roughly day seven is the transformula. We aim for a minimum of five days, but the length of time is solely dependent on the carp itself. We just want to make sure that, that carb is thriving, it's raring to go, it's sucking strong, and it's drinking at a reasonable speed. The last thing we want to do is put it in the back with other calves and just see it knocked backwards. Then day seven to 14, we're increasing the milk gradually from four to five liters a day where calves have a maximum two liters in any one feed. Day 14 to 28, that then increases from five liters to six and a half liters, allowing a maximum feed of three liters at any one time. And then from day 28 to day 56, we're holding it at that six and a half liters. Then day 56 to day 70, we're slowly reducing down to one and a half litres as we slowly wean them. We're fed, feeding the milk 150 grams of powder per litre. Uh, but in reality, I think it's more like 135 grams when you take into account that powder's being added to the water as well. So what I absolutely love about this system is the consistency. Mixing calf milk by hand does not give that sort of consistency. Variations in water temperature, especially when 
the outside temperature changes on a cold day water can feel so much hotter and how long before feeding that first calf and that last calf when you're carrying batches of milk around what's the, what the milk temperature difference then and also there's the concentration rate whenever we're mixing how many people say you had two jugs of water to that bucket of milk uh, two jugs of powder to that bucket of milk sorry how much is in a jug and then there's going to be the differences between different people feeding the calves if one person isn't doing it at all so i strongly believe that as long as you keep on top of your calf machine ensuring that the dispensing units are free from debris daily it's cleaned and calibrated every couple of weeks you're not going to see any variation in the product that you feed and the calves have never looked back they're happy and content and it's a pleasure to walk into our calf shed and be met with chilled animals and silence gone are the days of calves standing and shouting to be fed we also seem to have got rid of our navel sucking problem which we had previously when we batched calves together calves are presented with water from day two when they're penned up and then we've started nuts and hay from day seven as soon as they enter the group pens we've gone for the nuts we've previously tried uh, coarse ration but we found a lot of waste where calves were picking and we've also tried the smaller quicklets but found a lot of wastage from the slob of where calves are eating um, and it just going off quickly we've also been led to believe i don't know how true it is that using the larger nuts can help the rumen development as well and then from day uh, sorry from then week five roughly we are introducing our calves to a blend we have put together which includes our own rolled oats we like to look at all sort of aspects um, to keep things simple. So you can see the water tubs we make are from old chemical drums cleaned out and likewise for the hay racks. So where are we today? We feel very happy with how our calves are doing. And now we want to start looking at some of the finer details. We're introducing more for the calves enjoyment and mental stimulation. And we're also now vaccinating all our cows with B mica to help stop the mycoplasma bovis. And we're now at that point where we're having discussions with the vets of when we try and cut out the Draxin at birth. But it's all about getting the timing right. We've got to look at the weather conditions and everything, because the last thing we want to do is have this happen when the calves are under any kind of stress and to give them a knockback and to have it rear its head again. We've also managed to, one of the things we managed to do is to drop the use of alamycin, which we're using at stress points. Um, so when we were taking the calves out of this unit and moving them over into a grower unit, we'd give everything a shot of that just to prevent any flare ups. But now in a combination of the Draxin and the vaccine with good quality colostrum, we've confident and well, we've seen the results. We've managed to stop doing that. So our calves are all reared through to finishing. And if we look at our beef enterprise, it's an incredibly simple setup. Cattle house predominantly all year round, and they're on a simple grass, maize, straw, and brewer's grains ration, which is costing us roughly below well below one pound a head per day. And then for the final four to six weeks, we're giving them two kilos per head of rolled barley. And if we look at what we're sending off to slaughter, Holstein steers are averaging 376 kilos dead weight at 23 months and are O grade. Our blues are averaging 317 kilos at 20 months on a grade R. And our Angus cross are averaging 333 kilos at 21 and a half months, again, grade R. So I do believe we're getting around about 5% extra growth from our black and whites. But when you factor in the better price of the continental crosses, there's nothing in it. And you could actually say that the return on investment is better on the Holstein stairs when you've taken into consideration that you're starting off with a lower value calf to begin with. I'm a huge fan of dairy beef. I know that in blind tasting surveys, it often comes out on top and a time when the consumer is being encouraged to eat less and better. What can be better than a product that has taste, has quality, and you could also say it's off the back of 10,000 litres of milk. Uh, and something I think that really needs to be talked about more when we're talking about the carbon footprints of food. So what are my take home messages? One, keep things simple. If it's simple, it gets done. If you overcomplicate things, people will cut corners and it will tend to get left. Number two, there are huge opportunities in the dairy beef sector, which is often an overlooked and looked down on sector. So don't try and cut corners or compromise quality of inputs to save a few pounds, because at the end of the day, it's not worth it. It's a false economy. And three, for those of you that are buying in beef calves, ensure that they're from a reputable source and that they've had ample quality colostrum at the critical time as it does make a huge difference.
Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of this webinar. These are really important points Charles makes about being as sustainable as possible by producing profitable animals out of the dairy herd that would otherwise be surplus to requirements. The industry promotes every calf having a value. However, I want to add, if we're not careful, with good foundations of colostrum, animal management and optimum rearing, every calf has only a potential value. Analyzing elements of Charles's rearing system further, this slide is evident in highlighting the long-term effects of colostrum on not only the yield of his dairy herd, but the increased health, welfare and performance of all of his calves, whether it be his replacement heifers or his dairy beef for finishing. In these various studies, high immune status calves outperformed the low immune status calves in every aspect. Weight difference at 205 days was 29 kilos heavier from the same feed offered. Veterinary costs were also dramatically less and age at slaughter was found to be around two and a half weeks earlier than low immune status carbs. So chasing growth rates with high spec nutrition in pure immu poor immune status carbs is evidently a waste of time, disease pressure on farm, and ultimately it eats away at your potential profit margins. Charles and his vet recognized mycoplasma bovis as an underlying, underlying problem. It likely predisposed his calves to other illnesses due to weakened immunity. So he decided that his best solution was to vaccinate his cows in the dry period with calves then receiving the vaccinated colostrum as soon as possible post-birth. In Charles's situation, thoroughly cleaning the dam's udder when harvesting vaccinated colostrum and feeding three litres with a stomach tube as soon as possible post-birth with another three litres six to 12 hours later ensures his calves have the highest immunity like these studies with lowest disease burden. All of the calves in this study received a first feed of colostrum within two hours of birth before allocation to each of the treatments, being either colostrum, colostrum and cow's milk mix, or in other words, transition milk, or just whole milk. As you can see, there were significant differences between the colostrum and the whole milk group, as well as the 50-50 transi transition milk mixture and whole milk. However, there was no significant benefit to feeding just colostrum compared, compared to just feeding the transition milk mix post the initial colostrum feed. Additionally, similar cha significant changes or tendencies for changes in the duodenum, the distal jejunum and ileum were found. The factors that bring about change in gut development are present at high enough concentrations in a mix of transit in the in the 50-50 mix of transition milk. The jejunum is significant as it's the site of absorption of immunoglobulin G and requires additional protection as it is underdeveloped at birth, making it highly susceptible to pathogenic viral and bacterial attack. Also, the villi height of the cow's milk only fed calves was towards half that, the half the height of the colostrum and the transition milk fed calves as shown in picture C. Next slide, please. This slide further reiterates the previous sentiments. Calves in this trial gained an additional six kilos in the first 12 weeks of life when fed transition milk from days two to five, compared to the control group receiving only cow's milk post colostrum. If we look at just calves, what's going on inside the calf is far more important than just calf bloom. Transition milk contains antibodies, hormones, and other bioactive factors that cow's milk and standard calf milk replacer do not. It's possible on some farms more focus was put on the heifers when bull calves were moved off the farm quickly. But if the bulls are staying, then you're only as good as your weakest link. Having male calves with lower immunity on the farm affects all calves on the farm. And this will need to be perhaps highlighted to your staff or maybe incentivized, especially if the male calves were seen as less important in the past. The areas of transition milk feeding, with transition milk being the six milkings post the first colostrum milking helps the gut fun function as both the place for digestion and plays perhaps the biggest role in the immune system. Transition milk for even five days will improve calf growth, but we find that two to three weeks will have a further benefit on larger units with perhaps greater disease pressures. 97% of a calf's future performance can be predicted from birth weight, colostrum and transition milk feeding and dry feed intake at weaning whether that be weaning at five weeks, which uh, is 
can be legally done so, or eight weeks. We recommended back in 2019 that Charles fed his calves transition milk replacer for five to seven days post colostrum at minimum 750 grams a head a day. When healthy and their drinking speed was fri thriving, the calves hurdles were then removed and allowed then into the larger group and trained to the computer feeder, where they received the shine heft start, which is our follow-on milk replacer that's high in polyphenols, helping to counteract stresses to the young calf. Many dairy farms are faced with producing dairy beef from the remainder of the herd, not put to sex semen. As herd numbers are increasing, so are disease pressures within these calf rearing environments. The bacterium Mycoplasma bovis is transmitted through mucosal membranes, so the eyes, nose, vagina or rectum. Also infected cow's milk and it's able to survive on surfaces for months at low temperatures and weeks at room temperature. It's possible to have asymptomatic carriers in the herd, making elimination of the disease extremely difficult. As Mycoplasma bovis doesn't have a cell wall, it can remain dormant and then manifest after stressful events, for example, transportation or dehorning or weaning. Therefore, a gentle, simple system like Charles's is, is crucial in reducing instances. It is known to be antimicrobially resistant, making it difficult to treat and causes pneumonia, arthritis, and eye infections in calves, as well as affecting all age groups of cattle, whether that be pre-weaning, post-weaning, or in adult cattle. Johnson in 1999 uh, suggested that for each week a calf has pneumonia in the first three months of life can result in a 0.8 of a kilo weight reduction. As rearers, we're only ever as good as our weakest link. And the above picture illustrates the potential problems which may reduce performance and profitability in your rearing enterprise. Successful and ultimately profitable calf rearing requires utmost attention to detail. And amongst other factors, early success of the young calf heavily depends upon immune status, high immune status versus low disease pressure within its environment. Charles's overview highlights his attention to detail and commitment to improving aspects of his calf rearing, which is evident in many of his practices in the calf shed. This ultimately leads to long-term health, welfare and performance of his calves. He categorically does not feed waste milk to any calf, even the bulls. Mycoplasma bovis is a cause of mastitis, therefore feeding waste milk, it's highly likely it is a source of transmission of the disease. Not only that, but mastitic, mastitic milk is high in somatic cell counts, bacteria, and other sources of disease. Also a source of potentially antibiotics leading to antimicrobial resistance if fed back to the calf. Under the title, uh, that depicts the life cycle of biofilms. And as the, um, Mycoplasma cell mo membrane is uh, quite slimy. It can really easily adhere and attach to surfaces, uh, forming um, um, eventually a mature biofilm, which then spreads. So the hygiene of feeding utensils is paramount, including buckets and also things like the stomach tubes that you'd use. Washing feeding equipment with warm soapy water effectively breaks down the biofilms, which can threaten calf health. The picture in the top right shows us just really how quickly biofilms can build. All water bowls need to be cleaned daily to reduce mycoplasma biofilms. The bottom picture um, with the small auto refill drink has shown is really good for fresh ad lib water at all times. However, as it is a reservoir of each calf's saliva and mucosal membranes, this also still needs to be cleaned regularly. The all in all out rearing is the most effective. And I advised Charles to tweak his previous system where every calf was reared at first in nursery pens in the same area of the shed, as this meant that these areas never received a break. And now his calves being reared in nursery pens within the larger group means that, and also feeding the calves youngest to eldest, the young calf is then let into the area with the automatic calf feeder station once healthy and the drinking speed is strong, minimizing overall stress and setbacks. This allows time to clean out, disinfect and rest, as three out of the four resting areas are used at any one time. In the bottom right, make fresh dry feed available and discard any used feed daily to encourage intakes and reduce musty fermented film, uh, which is also a, a, a source of um, mucosal membranes and biofilms. In regards to airspace, you can see from Charles's pictures 
that the shed is really well ventilated and naturally light and airy, not sharing airspace with older cattle. Machine feeders allow flexibility, but really does not reduce the labour element. In fact, it can be greater, but instead of mixing and feeding and cleaning buckets, the workload is, is shifted to training calves and treating calves as the slide on the left will illustrate. Greater care, care in pet design is key to automatic feeders. Hygiene is difficult to maintain due to large numbers of calves with varying age ranges, all cross sharing the same teeth. The training pen of younger immune naive calves is also a disease multiplying area. Older calves, as previously mentioned, adapt to machines far easier. Charles, it, Charles also changes the teats on his automatic car feeders several times a day and sterilizes using Milton, which is another good practice, alongside the regular calibration to ensure the milk delivery is consistent. The same story for mycoplasma and biofilms apply to automatic car feed and mixing bowls and pipe work. So ensure cleaning equipment is calibrated, uh, cleaning detergent is calibrated, and I recommend servicing of machines uh, biannually. Bi Automatic car feeders are only a management tool at best and do have their limitations. Feed refusals and unrewarded visits suggesting potential feeding problems and uh, potential problems with calf health may only be noticed after a period of time. And, after, and as for mycoplasma in particular, swift treatment ensures the likelihood of no repeat episodes. On the other hand, individuals responsible for bucket feeding calves would notice any potential problems nearly immediately during or post milk feeding. As every farm has different obstacles posed in the calf rearing process, I'd advise a feed, feed plan suitable to your farm and do not fall back on the factory settings of the machines. Calf machine placement should not also not be overlooked. Placement for performance, i.e. drainage and calf usability, should be prioritised over convenience. Calves also do about 80% of their mess whilst eating and drinking, so water, feed and forage should be sited near to the feed stations to keep the lying area as clean and dry as possible. Also, if you look on the photo on the right hand side, farmers often comment that the weaned calves start bawling when they are removed from the machine, even though they may have been weaned by the machine for a week. This is because the calves are stealing milk from other calves, so we're not weaned at all. So I'd advise keeping calf age and size uniform on machines and ensure that two calves can't enter the feeding station at any one time. Weaned calves will eat concentrates if they have nothing else, but it does not mean that these calves can use it effectively. My advice is that all calves should be treated the same, whether it be replacement heifers or dairy beef for finishing. Success in calf health and growth is hinged on feeding high quality colostrum transition milk or transition milk replacer, followed by optimum levels of good quality milk replacer. Encourage calves to consume dry feed whilst ensuring fresh clean water is always available to drive intakes and subsequent rumen development. The focus should be given to total feed consumed and slow incremental increases in dry feed intake. A calf is metabolically ready for weaning when it is consumes a total of 15 kilos of non-fibrous carbohydrates from calf starter this being the cumulative intake. The earlier it starts along with fresh water to drive this, the more diverse and abundant rumen mi microbe population there is. There needs to be a balance in the metabolizable energy gap, this being the amount of energy a calf needs for maintenance of growth above that which the calf consumes in milk or milk replacer. So to summarize, dairy beef, bull beef is a profitable enterprise out of dairy cows if done correctly with no corner cutting. A simple system alongside good nutrition and an awareness of and plan to overcome potential problems that might arise equals success. Yeah, I just want to uh, again thank the uh, ADHB for the opportunity to, to present today and uh, and I want to set the scene first because um, I think it's not really said very often but uh, dairy farmers in the UK are big half rearers even if they're only rearing their, their, their dairy heifers. Um, and if they then wanted to re rear all their animals, uh, they're even bigger uh, again. So disease uh, loves big numbers. And so we've got to be aware of that. And um, we do know from, from research that uh, dairy farms that uh, have multiple enterprises like Charles's tend to have higher uh, 
dairy costs and lower dairy margins compared to specialized dairy farms. So our management needs to be red hot and we need to also uh, have, uh, plan our, our, our business so that we can monitor the performance of both enterprises uh, on the farm to ensure one is impeding on the other. And um, I also want to, I think, set the, the, uh, um, the theme as well in terms of what other countries are doing uh, in, in terms of uh, their uh, uh, plan to, to keep a positive value on the, the male, uh, our uh, surplus calves. So next slide. Um, if we look in, in Europe, uh, in the 50s, veal was uh, a meat that was really only produced uh, from suckled calves in the mountain regions of France and Italy. And in the 1960s, dairy calves started to be reared for veal. And by the 1980s, nearly, nearly 7 million animals annually were fattened for veal. And they consumed about half the skim milk powder and half the whey powder that the EU produced at the time. And there was no other outlet for those calves or for, for that milk. And if you look at today, it's still probably close to 5 million or one in every six calves born in the EU is destined for veal. And there's still... Uh, 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 consume of nearly 40% of all the whey powder produced uh, in, in the EU. Now, while the veal producers claim now that the, their system is a high welfare system, many of the bad practices, uh, many of these bad practices, which, which turned out not really to be uh, 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 necessary or effective in production, these bad practices have tainted uh, both the consumption of veal and the production of it in any format, uh, format in, in other countries. And I think we've got to be, just uh, be aware of veal is, is not how to solve a problem. Uh, um, and uh, that's the unfortunate. Um, if we look um, at the US, uh, the use of uh, sex semen has allowed uh, uh, the use of beef straws in the dairy herd to increase fourfold. Um, uh, so even in the land of the cowboy and the longhorn, uh, beef from the dairy herd will play an increase, increasing role and no better men to market products. And I think that hopefully they, they do market it well and we, we can actually uh, uh, benefit from that um, because I think what Charles is doing on his farm or what uh, other uh, dairy farmers could be doing, uh, you know, it, it can give a real positive uh, uh, story to the production of beef and the consumption of beef in the UK. Now, I, I, I mentioned the uh, New Zealand because, uh, um, uh, uh, as we know, most bulls are killed there uh, immediately after birth. But I only mentioned it because if we compare it to the UK, uh, in the, in, in the, um, we're trying to rear all our calves, uh, and yet they're uh, only rearing 20% of their animals. So it means every animal gets far more colostrum, far more transition milk, uh, there's, uh, there's more available labor to look after them, uh, and, and the housing is also not under pressure. So, you know, we have to be uh, aware of that, that when we increase numbers, uh, we do increase challenges on our farms. And as I said, you know, the UK is a big calf rear, uh, the UK dairy farmer is a big calf rear. If we go to Holland or, or France, often we only find three calves on each feed station are six or eight calves on milk on any farm at any one time. So, you know, again, the weather's better and the uh, um, climate's better. So uh, uh, calf rearing is much easier in, 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 in those countries for, the, for those reasons. Um, I know other people are going to cover uh, um, uh, housing and they're covering it today, but I just wanted to mention two important points in calf rearing. Uh, um, and it, particularly when you're getting bigger, you need to think small. So smaller groups and the rule of six, which we're, we were all aware of, isn't uh, uh, something uh, picked out of the sky uh, like many of the other COVID uh, uh, um, uh, control measures. But the rule of six is actually a proven mathematical number. Uh, diseases don't like uh, uh, no, uh, groups less than six. And uh, so if you can keep your, your young calves in small groups, uh, the same age, um, and uh, it does help particularly young calves during the, the, di the diarrhea uh, stages. Um, and secondly, the, the, the second area, and uh, I think Charles alluded to it too, is that um, in the past we thought two meters was, was ample uh, space for a calf, but I think on large units, six meters uh, per uh, area per calf is a far better figure to be working on. Why? Because again, diseases don't like uh, a space, and they don't, uh, um, and uh, it makes it more difficult for them to, to pass from calf to calf and therefore you're going to have a, a, a less disease and more growth and, and less work. And I just put this uh, um, 
these photographs up from David Dibble's farm in Somerset. He, he built this unit about 10 years ago. Um, he can group calves in, 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 uh, from a few days calvings uh, into each uh, pen. Um, the, the calves are easy to train in the pen. It's easy to feed them, easy to bed them, easy to keep them clean and warm. And uh, most of, uh, important, they're all isolated. And he starts feeding the youngest calves first and then, and then moves on. And the proof is in the pudding mortality rates uh, are about three uh, percent and uh, over the last 500 calves um, again like charles he starts off with transformula and then he moves uh, uh, on to shine original thereafter so uh, um it's it's uh, uh, as i say it's it's a good system for keeping your controls in your car theory. next slide Another option is, to, as uh, two of our Pembrokeshire farmers uh, 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 have done, is to uh, use a marquee over uh, a, a, a silage pit um, uh, to actually vastly increase their uh, calf rearing space on the farm. Uh, again, diseases don't like this. So again, it allows them to con keep uh, control of their calf rearing, their block calvers. So they have a lot of calves around at one time. And so they get better growth rates and lower costs by just keeping in control of the calf rearing in, in that case. So next slide. So I think it's important when we're discussing calf rearing that we actually uh, don't lose sight of what calf rearing really is about. Uh, calf rearing is about uh, keeping calves healthy, healthy and allowing them to develop develop into ruminants without giving them any growth checks or, or, uh, throughout that period. And if we if we just go for growth on its own, it, it can leave us into a, into a, um, the wrong area. So it, it, we have, instead of one or two metrics, we need to look at the, the calves uh, in a broad picture. And um, uh, I was listening to a, a quantum physicist, a professor of quantum physics, being uh, interviewed on uh, BBC recently, and he was asked why, as an undergraduate, he had um, changed from biology to quantum physics. And he said, well, with quantum physics, he found that when he uh, learned more, he understood more. But he said he found in biology, uh, when he learned more, he understood less. And yes, so um, nutrition is a, a complex su subject and we are learning more. And if we look at the, uh, the microbes or the microbiome in the class, we realize now that th these uh, uh, microbes have a huge role in developing the gut as a site of uh, digestion and a, an important part of the immune system. And they, they have a key contributor to the animal's long-term health and, and, and uh, performance. And these uh, microbes come from, uh, are even found in the womb. And even one of our, our, two of our colleagues who worked on colostrum and vaccines were quite surprised at how high the TBC is in colostrum, but actually, a lot of that PBC is actually very valuable to the calf. Uh, and so again, maybe we shouldn't be uh, so quick to, to uh, um, pasteurize clots because maybe we're missing something there. We're certainly damaging some of the oligosaccharides as well. And again, from following on from that, for the colostrum, we also find it's the same for transition milk. And it, 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 both transition milk and colostrum are more than just the, uh, about the immunity of the, the animal, they're about the development. Of, of the animal and uh, it, uh, milk feeding comes next that also plays a key role as does starter feed as does water and as does fibrous uh, uh, fiber feed as well so instead of putting colostrum on a pedestal i think we need to put colostrum transition milk milk replacer or milk starter feeds water and fiber on the same pedestal and we need to feed them in, in unison and to make sure that that as selena said that we get early intake of ration because that is going to generate uh, and help the calf develop. And it's, a, it's an important uh, uh, factor. Um, and you know, 50 grams of intake at, at two weeks of age is probably more important than a kilo intake of dry feed uh, at uh, eight weeks of age. So uh, next slide. Um, and uh, I think we've, we've kind of looked at, at how much milk we should feed uh, Calves, and um, I, I think often we're looking at the what the dairy cow can produce, and what the uh, calf can actually consume. But if we actually look at what um, traditional breeds and beef breeds actually uh, supply to their calves, 
I'm uh, surprised how uh, low it is. And in the case here, on in this slide here, this this breed here, they're only uh, they will only produce six uh, kilos or six liters of milk for their calf. Well, this is because the, the cow doesn't see her, herself as a walking vending machine. She has to stay healthy herself. She ha her job is to, to protect and, and nurture and comfort and train the calf and educate the calf how to become independent of her. So she she's not going to uh, flood the calf in milk. Uh, she gives it the right amount of milk to encourage, uh, as we said, the, the animal to eat other feeds and to, to develop its its overall digestive system. And, uh, um, and other people said, well, the calf can drink six to seven liters in one, in one feed. So if we feed them twice a day, we should be feeding them maybe 40 liters of milk. But again, if we look at animals that are, are born on the ground and hidden in, in the undergrowth, they, those, their uh, mother's milk tends to be very, very high in casein, which is the milk or the protein that clots in the uh, in the stomach, and it is a slow release uh, of food uh, right throughout the day. So uh, the calf drinks uh, up to six liters in one feed because he might only be fed once every 24 hours or 36 hours, depending uh, on what uh, how difficult it is for the cow uh, and how safe it is for the cow to actually feed it. So it's nature's way of um, uh, 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 you know allowing the animal to be uh, sated and, and fed without putting both the calf and the cow uh, uh, under pressure from, from predators. And when we look at uh, um, uh, lambs and we take single lambs off uh, uh, their single bearing ewes um, and we do trial work on them, we can finish those uh, uh, lambs in seven, eight, nine weeks of age on milk um, because the growth rates are phenomenal. So that shows again that the, even in the ewe is not giving the lamb what it potentially can drink because again she wants to uh, make sure the lamb will be independent of her over time so she feed it to a level and then encourage it to consume other feeds so and again i just want to show you why dry feed is is so important and this is a, a trial we did at harper adams where we're using our concentrated um, uh, uh, calf milk milky whey being at about 500 grams a day which is equivalent of around 650 700 grams of, of a standard milk uh, in terms of fat and milk protein levels um, and again these animals yes they were two or three weeks of age but we were getting you know over 200 kilograms of cake intake uh over the 12 weeks of the of the trial and the animals did over a a, a, a kilo or almost a kilo gain uh, on either hay or, or straw as a fiber uh, source and the the um the the secret here is that we were able to get the calves consuming huge quantities of of, of dry feed we were able to get them uh their their, their development of their uh the gut in line with their growth rate so the uh, uh, on the outside they looked as well uh, as they did or sorry the inside they looked as well as they did on the outside and uh, so when they were weaned they had no weaning check really at all um, and this is really the secret to good health because again we find calves at uh, weaning can often suffer things like coccidiosis or pneumonia and that can be direct, directly related to either inflammation in the gut and again weaning checks uh, uh, um, uh, um, over the two three week four five even five weeks after weaning Sorry, excuse me um, so next slide and this explains again why we need to to work uh, animals uh, in tandem. Uh, this is a trial where animals were fed uh, cow's milk. They were fed either six liters of cow's milk or twelve liters of cow's milk, weaned at forty-seven or ninety days. And the, the, if we look at the cost just of the ninety-day feeding uh, rate, it would have been last year over five hundred uh, pounds per uh, calf. Um, but the problem here again is that we, we were we were pushing the, the calf with the milk, um, and the the rumen and the large intestine isn't developed, uh, and so when the animal is weaned, it can't it can consume the the dry feed, but it can't digest the dry feed effectively, so the animal falls behind, um, so and the animals quickly lose weight uh, and are no better off after a huge investment um compared to the animals fed a lower quantity so we need as i say to move the feeds in tandem um 
because the, the conversion of the microbiome and the development of the rumen take a lot longer than we, we, we've thought in, in the past. Um, and again, it's, it's worth saying that we've, in the UK, um, they have the best uh, uh, dry feeds. We see better feed conversion ratios, better intakes and better live weight gains in, uh, on UK dry feeds than we do in other parts of the world. And there's a, a reason for that in a sense that in Europe, because a farmer only has a number, small number of animals, uh, and particularly prior to the ending of milk quotas, if you look at places like France, a guy would be, a farmer would be buying a bag of coarse ration maybe once a month. So they just didn't. They just, the calves are fed uh, milk uh, and then offered forage. So they were, so they, they were never pushed uh, uh, in the same way that we can we can push them with the dry feeds that we have and people need to realize that when a calf consumes dry feed it'll be broken into microbial protein in the rumen and when we look at microbial protein it has the same amino acid spec as skim milk powder and it, what's important with all calf breeding and all uh, is that animals have a, an amino, amino acid uh, requirement. They don't have a crude protein requirement and they don't have a protein requirement, but they have a crude protein requirement. And we can get that by converting the feed in the room and intermicrobial protein, and we're effectively giving the calf um, skin milk powder, and then he can, it, it, the calf will digest that and get the benefits from it. So the calf isn't uh, being poorly and hardly done if, if he's encouraged to eat dry feed uh from an early age he's getting a, a first class feed um next slide and th this this slide and it's a meta-analysis so we have to be uh, uh, careful with it as a, 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 a in interpreting it but they looked at trial work where calves are fed 600 grams versus not plus 900 grams and what you can see here is that we're weaned about six weeks of age from memory and um but they looked at the ability of the animal to eat fiber, which would in turn uh, uh, determine how much the animal could actually consume on a day. And it took up to nearly 16 weeks of age before the animals were actually comparable to the lower uh, uh, feed rate animals. So that means if you're trying to do bull beef, it, it takes four months for your animals to catch up if you overfeed milk. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, that's because we, we realize now that uh, the conversion of the animal um, if we promote the grow too much with uh, milk, uh, it just takes too long. So we need to keep the feeds working in, in tandem together. So next slide. So finally, uh, you know, to, uh, to summarize really, we need to keep um, the calf uh, uh, on your farm simple. We need to keep all, uh, and treat all calves the same. We focus on all feeds colostrum, transition milk, milk, or milk replacer, uh, straw, water, concentrate. We focus on, all, on them at all times. We put them on the pedestal together. Keep uh, um, your uh, intake of, of milk solids at around seven to 800 grams a day at an optimum and, and, and encourage early dry feed intake and plan for weaning four to six weeks before it actually happens. And then you will have no weaning checks and treat your calves kindly after weaning because again a grow a, a, a grow check then and a disease then can have a long-term negative effect on an animal's a future performance but if you get the weaning right you'll have a robust animal to so when you go out to grass or you put them on a a, a concentrate system uh, to finish them early these animals will be able to withstand uh, stresses and will perform well <laughs>